Welcome to the Kuyuka Podcast, written by Dr. Jean Domasen Wizimana, Minister at Minuwunge, and recorded by Josue Ishema. After years of research, he has collected and compiled information on different actions that led to the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi. In today's episode, we will discuss the role of the then justice system in the preparation and execution of the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi. Starting from October 1990, the government employed numerous tactics to justify to Rwandans and the international community the widespread arrests. One method used by the government was to declare that the overwhelmingly Tutsi detainees arrested during the sweeps that began on the night of October 4th to 5th, 1990, were caught with weapons and ammunition supplied by the RPF, which they intended to use to overthrow President Habyarimana's regime. False accusations were thus made against countless innocent individuals incarcerated across the country. Let's illustrate this institutionalized system of torture, accusations, and violation of the most basic human rights with a few indicative cases. The first, Louis Rudahunga was a senior official at the Kabgai printing press. On October 5, 1990, at around 11.30 am, the president of the Gitarama First Instance Court and the Gitarama Prosecutor, accompanied by military personnel, went to search Rudahunga's home and office. They found nothing compromising. However, the next day, the head of the Gitarama Intelligence Service, Joseph Nzawonima, had him arrested and thrown into prison. Rudahunga was kept in a dark, bedless cell without food. During his interrogation, two military personnel pointed a pistol and a large caliber rifle at his face, two others bet him with a baton and metal wires, while a third military officer noted the predictated responses from Rudahunga. He was interrogated lying flat on his stomach, with his arms tied behind his back. These acts were committed under the orders of Gitarama prosecutor Polan Huwiri, Major Bernard Nuyahaga, who was the commanding officer in Gitarama, and Gitarama intelligence service agent Joseph Zawonima. The government press Imvaho and Radio Rwanda were used to defame and humiliate Rudahunga and to convince Rwandans that he was betraying his country. Journalist Gaspar Senzoga, who was the Orenfo correspondent in Gitarama, published an article full of lies against Rudahunga in Imvaho, issue number 884, from March 4th to 10th, 1991. The article was titled Ikabgai Haonesamasasu which translates to In Kabgai, Cartridges of the RPF collaborators were discovered. It contained the following statements. The population of the city of Gitarama is asking questions about the RPF collaborators arrested and detained. They are surprised to learn that no evidence incriminating them can be found, and those arrested demand to be released. The inhabitants of this city continue to distrust these collaborators. They whisper that Gitarama has never been sufficiently searched. They claim that it is impossible that among all these detainees, no one can be found for whom evidence of having weapons or ammunition is held. Today, on February 25th, 75 cartridges were discovered hidden in the Kabgai printing press. Louis Rudahunga, who worked in this printing press and is currently detained, took precautions by hiding the remaining cartridges. He has just handed them over. Those to whom he distributed them have not yet been identified. However, this printing press has been searched many times without finding anything, but some people assert that Yitaram had not yet been searched enough. A militant who realized that if the searches were conducted meticulously, evidence against those who claimed to be innocent would be found provided useful information. Those authorized to search considered the importance of this information. On Monday, February 25th, they returned to Kaugai for the fourth time. This displeased a white man who managed the printing press. He even wanted to deny them permission to search, threatening to complain to the bishop of the Kaugai diocese. 
after finally granting them permission, they searched meticulously and discovered envelopes containing three small packets of pistol cartridges. In the same envelopes, there were also small papers. One of them had a drawing of a pistol and the other had the inscription sold avant de part en congé, 75, which translates to balance before leaving for vacation, 75. This number corresponded to the 75 cartridges found in the three packets within the envelopes. Louis Rudahunga admitted that the handwriting was his but denied ownership of the cartridges as a way to exonerate himself. The pistol drawing came with instructions starting with the initials MRL, meaning Monsieur Louis Rudahunga. One may wonder where the other cartridges Rudahunga distributed were, as he himself wrote that before his leave that there were only 75 cartridges remaining. These unexplored pieces of evidence should be a cause for concern. Those feared to be investigated must be scrutinized for the truth to emerge and suspicions to cease. All these accusations against Rudahunga were fabricated as evidence by the prosecution to imprison him. Independent investigations conducted by the Kabgai diocese revealed it was a setup to falsely incriminate Louis Rudahunga. Rudahunga's proven integrity led the Belgian director of Kabgai Printing Press to conduct a counter-investigation in collaboration with the bishop of the Kabgai diocese, Bishop Tadenseng Yumva. They discovered that the cartridges attributed to Rudahunga had been surreptitiously placed in his office by certain employees of Kabgai Printing Press under the orders of Gitarama's prosecutor, Polan Huiri, Major Bernard Nuyahaga, who commanded the army in Gitarama, and the intelligence officer in Gitarama, Vincent Guilahira. Louis Rudahunga was finally released on March 12, 1991. He was reinstated in his position, but those who orchestrated the operation continued to persecute him. Let's give another example, this time from the office of the Prosecutor General of the Republic. The report from the Attorney General, Reverend Okama, number 2 slash 422 slash homes dot 177 slash progero dated december 19th 1990 addressed to the minister of justice entitled report on the files of Inhotani, mentions accusations against 32 individuals who were considered ringleaders an analysis of this report highlights its weaknesses for example narcis munyambaraga and his co-accused this group called Munyambaraga was the most famous. Three charges appear as follows. Treason against the Rwandan Republic for bearing arms. Maintaining criminal relations with the RPF to support war and attacks against the Rwandan Republic. Treason aimed at undermining legitimate power and the articles of the constitution through terrorism and war. The indictment dossier from Attorney General Javier Mukama states that the evidence against Narcis Munyambaraga and his associates resides in their admission to being responsible at the national level for collecting ideas and all issues related to the RPF. The dossier continues its accusations as follows. The coordinator of their committee's work is Narcis Munyambaraga. His deputy is Carpofor Catera. The secretary in charge of propagating the ideals of the Nghotani is Donatien Rudyema, assisted by Ignace Ruhatana. Jean-Baptiste Kalini Jawo and Pierre Wayengana are in charge of recruiting members and gathering reliable information on the strength of our military, their arsenal, and their determination in the performance of their duties. All those who have just been listed recruit members who form groups in each prefecture with the aim of preparing for the return of the Inhotani by holding restricted meetings that spread rumors in the population, convincing them that ethnic and regional balance is equivalent to racial discrimination like that practiced in South Africa. They also propagate that wealth is in the hands of a few people while salaries do not increase. Thus, life becomes increasingly expensive and difficult for the population. They have propagated in the population the idea that the ethnic mention on the identity card constitutes ethnic discrimination. The Attorney General's dossier concludes, The evidence against them, 
consists of what has just been clarified. They all admit to the crime, implicating each other. The prosecutor, based on the nature of the crime and the irrefutable evidence he has just demonstrated, requests the death penalty for all the co-accused and the payment of legal fees. This is the limited evidence that, according to President Habyarimana's regime, would justify that the members of the group called Munyambaraga are considered accomplices in the war initiated by the RPF on October 1, 1990. However, these individuals walked in various sectors of the public and private sectors, and it has not been demonstrated that they knew each other for an extended period to constitute evidence that they jointly plotted a conspiracy. The list of meetings held by Narcisse Munyambaraga and his associates, the locations, their recommendations and other evidence confirming their criminal complicity were not disclosed. Additionally, it was not proven how these civilians, lacking access to confidential information from the Rwandan armed forces, acquired such information as this is typically exclusive to the military unless they have collaborators within the army. Yet, in the Munyambaraga group's case file, no military personnel were accused with them and no other evidence showed how they could have accessed military information normally protected by the defense secrecy. Relying exclusively on the accused's alleged admissions is insufficient, especially considering that during their trial, they clearly proclaimed their innocence and explained that their confessions were obtained under torture during interrogations by the prosecutor and the Central Intelligence Service. Physical signs of torture on their bodies were shown to human rights organizations that visited them in prison. Narcisse Munyambaraga and his associates demonstrated that they had been tortured multiple times by the gendarmerie within its criminology service based in Muhima. This service was notorious for such atrocities, which it did in close collaboration with the Presidential Intelligence Service. Victims endured electric shocks, forced urine consumption, ingestion of fell waste, and other unimaginable acts. Another example, who was also accused in this landmark trial. In early October 1990, he was arrested and detained at the Kikondo Gendarmerie before being transferred to the Henjiri prison. On October 28, 1990, he underwent a rigorous six-hour interrogation by the Gendarmerie and the Presidential Intelligence Service. He endured beating and kicks with his arms tied behind his back and intermittent electric shocks. Meanwhile, he was read names of Tutsi labeled as RPF accomplices, forcing him to confess collaborating with them. After this grueling interrogation, he was isolated for over a week in a dark cell. On November 16, 1990, he underwent another interrogation under the same torture conditions. The intelligence service coerced him into signing a document confirming his involvement in preparing RPF incursions against Rwanda. Donatien Rujema also suffered similar torture. Compelled to confess to preparing RPF incursions against Rwanda, he signed his admission under the onslaught of beatings. To force his confession, he was handcuffed and his arms bound tightly behind his back for a week in a dark cell. On October 6, 1990, he was transferred to Kigali prison where he was interrogated by the prosecutor. During this interrogation, he denied everything he had confessed to the intelligence agents under duress. He was never allowed to read his file, despite the law guaranteeing him this right. He became aware of the charges against him on the day of his appearance, December 28, 1990. His trial concluded on February 1, 1991, and he was sentenced to death along with his companion, Charles Mukuradinda and their three co-accused. In April 1991, their sentences were commuted to life imprisonment. They were eventually released in February 1992, following an agreement on prisoners of war signed in Ensele, the Democratic Republic of Congo, between the Rwandan government and the RPF, mediated by President Mobutu. In the same vein, 
It is worth noting cases of serious and false accusation against Tutsi priests who were accused as accomplices and tortured, similarly to those in the Narcisse Munyambaraga group. During the arrests of the RPF accomplices, Tutsi priests were wrongfully arrested and detained. Their expatriate friends sought the intervention of international human rights organizations to exert pressure on the government for their release. On February 21, 1991, Prosper Mugiraneza, the Secretary General at the Ministry of Justice, drafted a report on behalf of Minister Sylvestre Tsanzimana, addressed to Rwanda's ambassador abroad, providing information on the reasons for these arrests. The content of this report indicates that the alleged accusations against these individuals were unfounded, driven by injustice, hatred, and jealousy. Let's analyze these cases. The most prominent case was that of the priest, Augustin Hagara, arrested and held in Gisenyi prison. The Justice Minister's report indicates that he was arrested for having family ties with RPF members and collaborating closely with them to prepare for the invasion of Rwanda. He was also accused of publishing a document intended to incite the population to rise against the government. The elements of the report are, in reality, limited to a letter he and his four colleagues from the Nyundo Diocese, Fathers Calixte Kalisa, Jean-Baptiste Hatejeka, Fabien Guacareke, and Alois Nzaramba, addressed to the bishops of Rwanda on May 30th, 1990. In this letter, these priests expressed their opinions in response to a publication by the bishops of Rwanda on February 28, 1990, titled Christ our unity. Father Nagara and his colleagues stated that they had read this letter to all Christians in their parishes. Still, they pointed out that the bishops had not addressed certain issues deserving attention. Firstly, they wished for the swift establishment of a harmonious framework for consultation among religious leaders on the real problems faced by the general population and Christians in particular. Secondly, in anticipation of the Pope's visit to Rwanda, they sought the church authorities' permission to discuss with him the major problems threatening the country. Among these issues, they mentioned national unity, the policy of ethnic and regional balance emphasizing its discriminatory basis. They gave examples of individuals denied employment due to ethnic affiliation instead of considering their competence. In conclusion, they addressed the following recommendations to the bishops. Religious individuals should have the right to debate the country's issues, speak the truth, and seek solutions together instead of facing sanctions for their expressed opinions. National unity must be based on fair justice. Thus, they requested the abolition of the policy of ethnic and regional balance urging the church to distinguish itself in this regard and stop relying on ethnicity in matters of hiring and selecting students in the minor seminary. Ensure that the church ceases to be an instrument of political power, but rather preserves its wisdom by telling the truth when necessary. This pastoral letter led to Father Nagara being charged with treason against his country, and he was imprisoned. However, he had committed no crime and was only speaking the truth in a letter intended solely for the authority of the Catholic Church. As it was not intended for the public, it could not form the basis for a charge of national treason. The Minister of Justice's report mentioned accusations against other priests who had been incarcerated during the arrest of the alleged RPF accomplices. These include Fathers François Savien Fizi, and Justin Ruterandongozi from the Chibungo Diocese, Modest Mungwarareva from the Butare Diocese, and Epimak Sherti from the Kigali Diocese. Fizi and Mungwarareva were charged with leading meetings to prepare for the Ngotanyi attack and having information about his progress without notifying the competent authorities. On the other hand, Ruterandongozi was accused of disparaging the head of state and disrespecting the prefectural authorities, Shakti was accused of collaborating with the RPF in war preparations. 
notwithstanding Rutera Ndongozi, who was killed during the genocide, and Modest Mungwarareba, who passed away on May 4, 1999, the others are still alive. In their testimonies, given after their detention, they all affirm that they had no responsibility for the alleged charges against them, they were lies. The late Father Modest Mungarareva personally recounted this and publicly testified before his death. The Minister of Justice's report also details other accusations, primarily against Tutsi intellectuals and merchants, accused and arrested for lies and abuses of power by President Habyarimana. The most well-known cases include Evariste Sisi, Dr. Vincent Mounier-Shuri, Dr. Abel Dushimimana, Isidore Barahira, François Kairanga, Thomas Karachire, Paul Gakuba, Charles Kanowana, and Celestin Gatera. Evariste Sisi was accused of financing a terrorist group of the Inhotani and forging identity cards for the country's enemies to infiltrate everywhere. Dr. Vincent Mounier-Shuri, in turn, was accused of possessing blank identity cards, allegedly to facilitate the infiltration of the country's enemy into the wider population. He passed away in Belgium in 2011. He declared that all accusations against him were unfounded. His colleague, Dr. Abel Dushimimana, was accused of being aware of the RPF attack plan and not disclosing it to the authorities. The same accusations were alleged against Isidore Barahira and François Kairanga. Thomas Karachire, on the other hand, was accused of harboring enemies of the country. This deception by the government is also evident in the case of Paul Gakuba because in his report, the Minister of Justice mentions that he was suffering from a chronic illness, taken to the hospital for treatment and died there some time later. But as we saw earlier, Paul Gakuba actually died because the Butari Prison Administration refused to provide him with medical care and the necessary medication. On the list of the 128 people we consulted, who were arrested by the intelligence service on the charges of being accomplices of the RPF, none were arrested based on reliable evidence that could incriminate them. The first person on this list is named Avi Zeyman. The reason for his arrest by the intelligence service was that he was arrested for joining the Inhotani. The next on the list is Veneranda Akimhai. The intelligence service that arrested her mentioned that she was denounced by the Palutin sisters of Jikondo. Crucial questions remain, such as, what are the accusations for these sisters? For what reasons? On what evidence? However, this information is nowhere to be found. The reason for the arrest of the musician Lotibi Zimana was that he composed a song for the Inhotani. Again, nothing is mentioned in this indictment. For the renowned musician Diodonevi Zimungu from the Abagogwe lineage, which originates from Giseni, it is written that he was denounced by Jean Bosco Kalisa Kaitare. He was an RPF liaison officer between Kampala and Kigali. Concerning Hawaga Hongaire, it is noted that she was arrested because she was a friend of Kaje Guhakwa. As for Venonga Tete, his indictment specifies that he collaborates with the Inhotani by providing them with money. He is one of those who attacked Kigali on the night of October 4th and 5th, 1990. Yet, there is no evidence of his participation in that attack, nor any evidence that he gave money to the Inhotani. The reason for the arrest of Jean-Marie Mbaguta is his alleged provision of information about the country's economic situation. A young girl, Ildegard Mukamujema, only 15 years old, was arrested by the intelligence service because she was sent to the country by the Inhotani from Uganda. She had no travel documents. How could the Inhotani employ such a young girl as a spy? Another person, Marie Mukamusoni, was detained on the pretext of being an accomplice of the RPF for making phone calls to Holland, England, and Belgium. Violette Murorunghere was also arrested because she is the friend of Asumta Karangwa, who was Fred Guigema's fiancé. She participates in RPF meetings. That raises the following questions. 
When did these engagements take place? How did they happen? What confirms them? These proofs are simply not mentioned. Regarding Frédéric Mutaguera and Felicien Mutarikanwa, it is written that they were aware of the RPF attack. For Mutarikanwa, his accusers add that at his home, they found many people singing Mutara, which translates to We have returned to Mutara. For Primienye Manzi, it is mentioned that he was arrested because he had 146,000 francs on him that he could not justify the source of. He was about to send this amount to the Ingotanyi. For another accused, named Daniel Nzawangita, it is noted that he was arrested in Muhima at 7 p.m. during curfew hours. Intelligence agents indicated that he was in Ingotanyi because he had no identity papers and did not know the name of the mayor or sector councillor of his commune. These are just a few examples illustrating that people were arbitrarily arrested and detained based on the ideology of the genocide. Several magistrates and personnel in the justice sector were involved in the genocide and found guilty of this crime, demonstrating the failure of this institution supposed to uphold justice. Check out the rest of our podcast and share them with others.